morning. And welcome to All Face. Welcome to All Face Unitarian Congregation. Today we are celebrating Father's Day. My name is Doug Cartwright and I will be leading our service today. Here you will find diverse and inclusive spiritual community where we welcome people with many faiths. You can bring your whole self, your full identity, your questioning mind and expansive heart. At All Face we have more than one way of experiencing the world and understanding the sacred. No matter who you are, wherever you are in your spiritual journey, and no matter whom you love, you are truly welcome here. Is anyone visiting for the first or second time? Thank you, good, <laughs> welcome. We're glad you're with us today. If you'd like to know more about All Face, you can see someone at the uh, uh, the welcoming corner, which is just behind the folding doors, or you can visit on our website at allfaceuu.org. There are uh, announcements on the back side of your uh, order of service, and you can take that home and refer to it. But one thing that I'd like to point out is that Friday we are starting Tai Chi, Tai Chi Chi. I don't know why Tai Chi Chi is Tai Chi Chi, but I always refer to it as Tai Chi. But uh, at 10 o'clock, there is weekly sessions that are beginning uh, with the uh, uh, volunteer uh, Linda Finian, Finland. And I think there's, a, there's donations at the door if you wish, um, but uh, it's no cost. And also, uh, unannounced, there's um, uh, the John Lewis Make Good Trouble bus that is coming to Fort Myers and it's going to be um, taking off on the, uh, from the Quality Life Center Annex that's on Martin Luther King Boulevard and it's going to be at 12 noon. What day is it? What, what day? When, Wednesday, the 21st, if you uh, wish to uh, join that. <clears throat> anyway, today we'd like you to rise in body or spirit as we sing together hymn 361, Enter, Rejoice, and Come In. Father's Day, I'd like to ask our founding father, Wayne Robinson, Dr. Wayne Robinson, to uh, come up and I will actually light the service, uh, light the chalice in his name. Um, and if you will, please uh, repeat the words in your order of service as he lights the chalice, actually I light the chalice. I'm going to light it, May Wayne. Okay. Wayne. The 
chalice candle is is giving me trouble. <laughs> it's giving Wayne trouble. It's <laughs> As John Lewis would say, get into some good trouble. At this time, I invite you to come forward and share any joys and sorrows or gratitude in your lives. Hi, I'm Bob DeGalbo. My wife is the president of the association here. She had major surgery on Friday. She is home, it was successful. She's resting very uncomfortably. <laughs> so all your thoughts and prayers, please. Thank you. You take good care of her. You're both very precious, thank you. Hi, I'm Michelle, I've been sick. Um, but I just wanted to let you all know that I love you guys dearly and I just have some great people here that are in my life and I want to thank you all. We're glad you're back with us. She went on a wonderful trip to Rome and came home with COVID. <laughs> so be careful when you're traveling. <laughs> Good morning, I'm Tina Noel and I wanna share my joy. Last night we had our eighth <coughs> open house at my house with the Audubon of Henry, Henry Glade's Audubon Association and there were 20 of us. And please don't ever turn down a chance for community and to share food and love with people you care about. Love you. Birds are my totem. I'm convinced I was an eagle in a form in life. Friends. All right, great, wonderful. Hi, I'm Joy Schaefer, and I'm here to give um, gratitude for all you do for McGregor Clinic. And you don't realize how happy they are when they see my car drive up. They <laughs> smile. They're so excited, and we want to thank you for your generosity for all the years. And we thank you for the many years of service to McGregor Clinic, helping families and people suffering from HIV AIDS. Good morning, my name is Ed Elrod, and I was supposed to get up last Sunday in Joys and Concerns, and we didn't have it, but last Sunday my wife and I celebrated our 68th wedding anniversary. <laughs> And I'm happy to say she's back home again, yeah. not in Indiana, in Florida. <laughs> These are people that really know how to love and live together. Yeah. It's been such a joy watching you through the years. There's a secret to being married 68 years. It's, quote, perhaps you are right, dear. <laughs> Hey, that we could t teach to the whole wide world. Perhaps you are right. <laughs> uh, I'm Lisa Linhart, and I haven't been here for a while. Um, but for the past almost three years, I've been taking care of my granddaughter and now grandson, too, in Orlando. And coming here periodically, and my husband going up there, and that also keeps a marriage nice. <laughs> It's like every, if you're away from each other for two weeks at a time, when you're together, it's just wonderful, you know? <laughs> so that, that's also um, a little point. Um, but our condo was finished. We got flooded out during the hurricane, and we are now moving in. We have boxes everywhere, and I told Joe, we have a bed and two chairs and boxes. And, um, but I did find out, this is just for you to know, that... I picked up a bag of pictures, photographs that were in a plastic bag, and they had gotten wet. We had some problems with the storage. We had a mixture of photos in there. Every Kodak picture was ruined, but the Polaroids were fine, and they were mixed up with them. So this is a commercial for Polaroid. <laughs> 
Polaroids withstand hurricanes. <laughs> so we're so happy to have you back with us, Lisa, and we hope to have some more storytelling from you. Here's our gators lady. Thank you. All these tips on how to stay merry, well, it didn't work. I didn't know those things. <laughs> So uh, we parted uh, company a long time ago for the betterment of both of us, I think. I'm here because Bob Way is not. Now, according to your information, he's in the hospital. Um, if you can send a note, a card, maybe drop by, whatever. Uh, he has sung for us, uh, Old Man River, wasn't it? Yeah. He, we miss Fran and Bob when they can't be with us. We're lighting this candle for Bob Way, who is suffering from a bronchial infection. He was taken into the hospital and be there another day or two. See you at Health Park. Also, Joan Marshall was going to sing for us today, but she also had to go to the ER and is suffering from a bronchial infection. My name is Flora Sweeney, and I am a member of the congregation when I'm here. Um, I'm back in Illinois. But I would like to say that you can be happily divorced. I've been, <laughs> I have been divorced since 1999, and I am back in Illinois caring for my ex-husband. But if it was not for the wonderful children I have, I never could have made it. But you can. You can make it through a divorce and be friends. <laughs> so absence can make the heart grow fonder. <laughs> Sometimes even when it's permanent. <laughs> all right. And I'm so glad all of you are here this morning to celebrate Father's Day with us on this beautiful, blessed day of rain. We've desperately needed this rain, and we've just had an abundance of it, and that brings along all the proper fertility for Father's Day. <laughs> I'm lighting this for all of you who have joys and sorrows in your heart. May you reach out to those who are unable to be with us, who are homebound, and share whatever resources you can. The, <clears throat> the corollary to absence makes the heart grow fonder is out of sight, out of mind. <laughs> Be, just beware. <clears throat> and now I'd like to ask everyone to close your eyes, take a deep breath, and let us turn our minds and our hearts to today's service and contemplate our blessings. Please rise in body or spirit as we sing together hymn number 123, Spirit of Life. Sing in my heart. 
our opening words are a poem by a Malid Melodia Ortez, and it's titled An Ode to Dads. Dads are the rock that holds us strong, a compass to guide us all along. The foundation of our lives they create, a stronghold of love that's never late. With strength and support, they stand by our side, a beacon of hope that never hides. Dads are the world we live in each day, and their love it what is what lights the way. There's two things I know for sure She was sent here from heaven And she's daddy's little girl As I drop to my knees by her bed at night She talks to Jesus And I close my eyes And I thank God for all of the joy in my life Oh but most of all, for butterfly kisses, bedtime prayer, sticking little white flowers all up in her hair. Walk beside the pony, Daddy, it's my first ride. I know the cake looks funny, Daddy, but I sure tried. Oh, with all that I've done wrong, I must have done something right to deserve a hug every morning and butterfly kisses at night. Sweet 16 today, she's looking like her mama a little more every day. One part woman, the other part girl. Perfume and makeup from ribbons and curls. Trying her wings in a great big world. But I remember butterfly kisses with mama there. I love you, Daddy, but if you don't mind, I'm only gonna kiss you on the cheek this time. Oh, with all that I've done wrong, I must have done something right to deserve a hug every morning and butterfly kisses at night. change her name today she'll make a promise and I'll give her away standing in the bridegroom just staring at her she asked what I'm thinking and I said I'm not sure I just feel like I'm losing my baby girl then she leaned over Butterfly kisses with her mama standing there, sticking little white flowers all up in her hair. Walk me down the aisle, Daddy, it's just about time. Does my wedding gown look pretty, Daddy? Daddy, don't cry. Oh, with all that I've done wrong, I must have done something. 
deserve her love every morning and butterfly kisses at night. Thank you, Carlos. <clears throat> The reading for today is called I Believe in Fathering, and it's by Evan Carville Zemer. I believe in fathering. I believe in the ra radical idea that men have the full human capacity to nurture, hair bow bows and baseballs, cooling, cooking and creativity, tools and tiaras, camping and dancing, snuggles and shrieks of delight. Too many fathers don't believe in their own fathering. Too many are scarred by their own fathers to hear their hearts say otherwise. Too many have known fathers who, faced with a quivering lip and tears, could say only, man up. Too many have known fathers who knew only yelling and hitting too many have known fathers who have lost sight of their sacred role of protector and became tormentor. But I believe in fathering. When a human being gestates and gives birth, her brain changes permanently. A father's brain changes permanently too. Changes as he rocks his baby to sleep, delights in baby games and soothes bumps and bruises. A father earns his new neurobiology. In a world where too many mothers hand their co-parents directions more specific than those given to the babysitters, where a father out with his kids is asked, are you babysitting? Or where's mom? Where fathers are the punchline. I believe in fathering. I believe in the radical idea that men have the full human capacity to mature, to nurture, whether their children come through birth, adoption, or fostering, through scouts, sports, Sunday school, or youth group. I've known too many gay dads, too many single fathers, too many men raising children others couldn't, couldn't to believe otherwise. I believe we all especially our children, deserve to know that the human capacity to nurture belongs to every one of us. I believe in fathering. Please rise in body or spirit as we sing hymn number 2000, 205, <laughs> Amazing Grace. <laughs> Yes. 
safe thus far, and grace will lead me home. When we've been years, bright shine. Joyce will introduce our today's speaker. Well, it's such a joy to introduce our speaker today. He's been visiting us for the last few weeks. Uh, he lives not too far away, and he was riding his bicycle, and he saw us, and he said, I'm curious about those people. I think I'll go and check them out. Um, Reverend Dr. Ron Archer has served as an NFL chaplain and a Pittsburgh Steeler, <laughs> linebacker, pastor, and world leader. He has advised several U.S. presidents, including George Bush and Barack Obama, top executives of Fortune 500 companies, and even military leaders. Hey, next time you talk to them, can you say perhaps you're right? <laughs> He was given the Martin Luther King Leadership Award for his work developing the hearts, hands, and habits of third world leaders to transform their nations from chaos to collaboration. He founded 25 churches in Kenya. His biography and life story of poverty, hardship, and overcoming all odds, in fact, I think you should call We Shall Overcome, what Belief Can Do was published in 2020. And his latest book is The Power of One Man, How God Uses Men Like You to Change the World. Dr. Archer's story went viral and he has traveled the globe inspiring millions with his testimony. In fact, I think he's leaving tomorrow to go for several European countries starting at Oxford and going to Turkey. He was born prematurely on June 15th, which happens to be my birthday, but quite a few, 24 years later. And this guy here weighed four pounds and two ounces. <laughs> Look at him. He was a sickly child who stuttered and was bullied by children in elementary school. But by high school, he was a football quarterback. As a fatherless 16-year-old, he was asked to preach in a church with more than 500 members leading their Sunday night services, kind of like we've invited our own Emmy Spiller to give sermons and lead our services at 16. So uh, I guess he knows how to do this. Please welcome our new friend, Ronaldo Archer, to our family of love. Thank you. Well, good morning to all. Good morning. It is indeed an honor and a privilege to be able to stand before you this morning on this day where we honor dads, pops, fathers throughout this land. And for me, being a father of two beautiful grown children and the grandfather of four, and spending time with them last week, knowing I'm going to be here and traveling to Europe soon after, it's such a joy sharing knowledge, pains, hopes, aspirations with the next generation. So my philosophy as a global leader is real simple. I believe this that we have come over on different ships, but that we're in the same boat now. 
we either learn to work together as friends or perish as fools. For a high tide can raise all of our ships. I think the brilliant, eloquent German philosopher, Hegel said it even better. He said that truth is not found in a thesis, nor is truth found in the antithesis, but that truth is found in the emergent synthesis that reconciles the two extremes. In football parlance, we use the term that none of us can be greater or smarter than all of us. Living in Africa for a few years, I learned much about nature. And so I'll give you a greeting from Kenya. Buana asafiwe, asante sade kerebu asante. And being out in the wilderness, you learn so much. And what nature taught me was something interesting I wrote in my book, in that when birds are threatened, they flock. When bees are threatened, they swarm. When zebra are threatened, they herd. When fish are threatened, they school. When people are threatened, they tend to split. And so my job as a U.S. envoy in Africa, El Salvador, and Dominican Republic is to bring the divergent perspectives of different ethnocentric ideological people and teach the lessons from Aristophanes, Euripides, Cleisthenes, and Pericles as they climbed the Acropolis, met at the Parthenon, and started this existential thing in 509 BC we call democracy. A people joined together with common ideas to create a more perfect union. Now, who keeps me humble in my life is my oldest son, Christopher. Chris is a military officer with the Space Force to boldly go where no person has gone before. <laughs> well, being my oldest son, he has a name for me. He just called me this morning. And when he calls me, he says, good morning, Baldy Locks. <laughs> the affection of children. While he calls me Baldy Locks, <laughs> I have a name for him. It's called heredity. <laughs> Keep living, boy. Your day's coming. But I also have a word I'm going to give you today. God doesn't put marble tops on cheap furniture. <laughs> So keep shining for the universe. <laughs> I come to you thinking about one of my clients, Bill Marriott, who built the Marriott Hotel chain. And his company was going through bankruptcy. He built the firm too fast, too wide, and about this deep, and couldn't handle economic change. So we sent him to one of our retreat centers in Maui, Hawaii to meet an elderly farmer from China who grew the most difficult tree in the world to grow called the Chinese bamboo tree. The farmer explained that he puts a seed in the ground. And after a full year of fertilization and cultivation and watering and irrigation, you look out after one full year of work and labor and see nothing for your efforts. You think that's bad, years two, three, and four are the exact same way. Can you imagine being a farmer, four years of labor, four years of investment, four years of time, four years of energy, and look out and see absolutely nothing? People would drive by and call him the mud farmer, <laughs> that all he was growing was mud. Four years of effort. No sign of life. Four years of a commitment, not a glimmer of hope that anything would be born. But that farmer knew something about this seed. That during the first three months of the fifth year, that seed would go into a tree that grew 90 feet in three months. It grew a foot a day for 90 straight days. But the question was asked, did it really grow 
90 feet in three months, or did it grow 90 feet in five years? Because if one day was missed in those previous four years, if one day was missed in the cultivation, fertilization of the mud, if one day was missed in the commitment to see that which doesn't exist but believe it's coming and to give as though it's there when it doesn't appear, if one day was missed, the miracle that took place in year five would have never happened. That, ladies and gentlemen, is my life story. Lots of mud, lots of hopelessness, lots of despair, but good people kept pouring water in a desert believing that there was something of value that would come someday. I was 10 years old, growing up in Cleveland, Ohio, and I put my mother's gun to my head. I wanted to blow my brains all over her wall. You must stop to ask the question, why? would a 10-year-old boy want to die? 10 is a time of dreaming of being a fireman, a police officer, a football star, a singer. But for me, my thinking was real clear. If the next 10 years are anything like the last 10 years, I don't want any more years. So I grabbed her gun, put it to my temple, closed my eyes, and pull the trigger. I'll come back to that. Why? What an innocent boy at 10 want to end his existence. Well, my family is biracial. My grandmother came from a little place called Berncastle Kuss in Germany. She was tall and white and skinny. She was so tall and white, our nickname for her was French fry. <laughs> My grandfather was a polar opposite. He grew up in the Sierra Maestra in Cuba, and he was a big, burly, dark guy. He was so black, he was purple. <laughs> and our nickname for him was Hamburger. <laughs> well, they both migrated to America, and Hamburger met French fry in Cleveland, Ohio, and they made a happy meal. <laughs> <laughs> and over time, they produced seven McNuggets. <laughs> Now, we celebrate the growth of our, I love them. I've lived all over the world, and there's no place like home. But America has evolved. We weren't always this enlightened, trying to get better. But back in the day of my grandparents' existence, interracial marriage was in some states illegal, and in most during that time, frowned upon as immoral. So my grandfather had to pretend he was my grandmother's driver. He would drive her to work at Woolworth, where she was a manager, drop her off, and go, I'll be back at 5 o'clock, pick you up now. And the people would go, your driver is so loving and kind. She said, you have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> Can I get some water there, if you don't mind? Sure. Thank you. I'm going to take yours. I, I know it's anointed. Um, I don't, I'm not drinking that. I'll take go it. Go ahead. No, go. You can hand it to me. There you go. Let me, let me help you. There we go. Teamwork makes the dream work. And so this went on for a while, but eventually time went on. And my grandfather, being a proud Cuban, said, enough of this hiding. They built their first home. He had his own business preparing radios and television. A proud man and said, we are going to go out together as husband and wife. Who cares what they think any longer? We paid our taxes. We built our homes. We're now American citizens. It's time to live the American dream. They go out to my grandmother's favorite restaurant called the Hofbra House. Mm-hmm. Wiener Sitzel, Sauerbraten, Strudel. Good German food. And they ate to their fill. It was their wedding anniversary. And they come out walking arm in arm together, celebrating the American dream, the beauty of the seven kids, and that everything you thought was possible could be done. But there was a man, not from the area, who saw these two committing what he thought was a moral crime. 
a black, beautiful, purple, gigantic gorilla and a beautiful Fraulein from Germany. He was a bit drunk. And he walked up to my grandmother and said, you are beautiful. Why are you a nigger lover? Why would you love a big black nigger like this? And my grandfather, being Latin, had a little temper. <laughs> he would drink overproof rum from Cuba. <laughs> they could send the rocket to Mars. <laughs> he had an anger problem. He took his fist and arm, went back to Cuba, came up through Florida, shortcut through North Carolina, <laughs> speedway through Pennsylvania, and hit the man's jaw in Cleveland, Ohio, with such veracity and tenacity, he broke the man's neck. <laughs> Let me tell you, it's not a good thing for a big black man to break a white man's neck in the 1950s in Cleveland, Ohio. He was convicted of attempted murder. He went to the worst prison in Ohio called Mansfield Reformatory. How many saw the movie Shawshank Redemption? Yeah. It was filmed at that prison. 120 degrees in the summer and 10 below zero in the, in the winter. He was locked in his cell 23 hours. It hit the newspapers that my grandmother was married to this convicted killer, attempted, and she got fired from her job. Bad publicity, bad for business. But Granny was a hardworking German woman. She began to clean people's houses or toilets, and something horrible happened. In certain cultures, when you embarrass the family, with these kinds of things, they shun you. Happens in the Amish community, who I work with. Well, in her particular German community, when you did something, interracial marriage, and your husband's in jail, the family shunned her. They had a funeral for her, took her clothing, her pictures, put it in a coffin, and buried it, and never spoke to her ever again. She didn't know her mom had died for two years later. She was by herself. A beautiful German woman in America with seven biracial kids and nobody to help her. To make matters worse, she's working these odd, crazy jobs, and she has fainting spells. She's fainting driving a car, fainting doing house chores, fainting going into bushes. Long story short, they find out she has cancer. A tumor growing behind her left eye, metastasizing to her brain that was causing the blackout spells. And they told her she was 35 years old, seven kids. If you're going to live, we got to take out your eye, half of your face, and a part of your frontal lobe. That's where the cancer has spread. If we don't do this, you're going to die. And all she thought about were her seven beautiful children, her little Liebchens, her little kinders. She had the surgery, and she was mauled. She was deformed. She was hideous. Nobody would hire her. She couldn't work. Deep depression. Couldn't make any money. They lost everything. They were evicted out of their home, lost their car, lived like animals, going from abandoned house to abandoned house. My uncles, who were young at the time, about 11 and 9, joined a gang called the Devil's Disciples, where they became drug dealers and became hooked on heroin. My mother, God bless her, was the oldest of the seven. She was 14. Imagine this beautiful German-Cuban mixture, long black hair, oil, olive hair, beautiful hazel eyes. And in the ghetto, that stands out. There was a man who was a predator, his name was Larry, and he saw her. He said, woman, hey, you, you're sitting on a gold mine. She's 14. Where? She's fully developed beautiful. Sometimes ladies, beauty in the wrong situation can be a curse and not a blessing. And this man convinced her, you can make a hundred dollars a day if you come to my nightclub and just be dressed up and dance with my patrons. I will pay you a hundred dollars a day. You can, he knew about it. You can save your, your brothers. You can help out your mama. You're the oldest. What is school doing for you anyway? Come down, let me help you. She was excited. She went down. It wasn't a nightclub. It was a sex trafficking ring. They beat her. They raped her. And she became a prostitute for 
two years. They took her to New York City and used her like an animal. Six men a day, ravishing her 14-year-old, 15-year-old, 16-year-old body. Once she told me something, it broke my heart. She said, son, you just don't know what people will do to you when they know you have no place to go and no one to help you. At 16, she got pregnant. And the people who ran her life said, oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> you are our biggest moneymaker. This can't happen. So they tried three times to abort the fetus. They tried everything you could imagine, but it just didn't work. But now she was infected, and she was bleeding. They threw her to the streets. And my mother had a premature child on the floor of an abandoned house back in Cleveland, Ohio. Now, for those who don't know the ghetto terminology, the lexicon of the hood, we call that having a trick baby. You're a prostitute, you're turning a trick, you get pregnant, and then you have this baby who was born not of two people in love, not of a loving relationship, but out of something called a prostitutional pregnancy, and the baby's called a trick baby. Nobody wants a trick baby. This is not anything of love, and so that trick baby was me. I'm a prostitute's kid, born in the ghetto, born in the sewer, got raped by a broomstick by a babysitter, couldn't talk, I wet the bed, I was a stutterer. I was almost, they called, a waste of human flesh. And after being raped with a broomstick by a babysitter, this female who was psychotic, I learned four things. Don't talk, don't trust, don't feel, and pretend nothing's happening to you. When you get traumatized, called a significant emotional event in your life, you learn, don't talk about it, don't trust anybody, don't feel, and try to pretend it never happened to you. So by age 10, I had enough. I'm a stutterer. I'm a bedwetter. My mom is still prostituting. I'm around drug addicts and drug dealers gunfights in my house, drug raids with police dogs, called retarded in school. They had a poem about me. His name is Renardo. He is a retardo. He sits on the steeple. When he talks duck, he spits at the people. I had enough. I took my mom's gun, put it to my temple, and thought this had to be better than this hell I was living in. I pulled the trigger, mom had a safety on the gun, so it wouldn't engage. I put it back in her drawer. I went back to my little cot of a bed, and I just cried out these words, help me. We were not a family of faith. We had no religious affiliation. We were just survivors. So I cried out, help me. And I believe something. When innocence cries to the universe, there are forces, angels, people, who hear that cry and respond to the tenderness of a child's brokenness. In the school next year, a new teacher came to the school named Mrs. Spears, old white lady with blue hair from Mississippi. And she asked the principal, who are your worst students? I will send here for them. This is my mission field, and they found me. And she said, hi, baby. <laughs> my name is Spears. I'm from Mississippi. They told me you couldn't talk. We going to fix that, baby. You got to learn how to talk if you're going to do something with your life. Because I can talk. I said, really? <laughs> <laughs> Why you add extra vowels to your words? <laughs> But this woman invested in me. I mean, she taught me phrases like, the sea ceaseth, and it sufficeth us, and proper preparation prevents poor performance, and possible punitive punishment, and at dawn the dawn went down, and our, I said, oh, a southern Mary Poppins. <laughs> <laughs> but she believed in me. She taught my mom to believe in me. She taught my aunt, who moved in with us, to believe. I learned everything about fatherhood from three women. Three women 
taught me what it meant to be a father. That they were strong. And they were leaders. And they had hope. And they were protected. And they provided. And they were aspiring. And they planted water in that seed in the mud for four years. Everything I am, I owe to women who taught me how to be a daddy. Women can be good fathers. In the hyena community, when there are no males, women, hyenas grow penises. I was in Africa, I saw it. <laughs> to do the job that no men could do, because they weren't there. So I took all that they poured into me, became valedictorian, got a full scholarship both in football and academics. I had one goal in my life, to make them proud of me. That that seed they planted and, and, and cultivated would not die. That I would be their dream. And I would take care of them someday. Went to college, that a Victorian. PhD, football player, in business, made my first million dollars. My first book I wrote on open space technology, affinity diagramming, and appreciative inquiry. Got hired by presidents to do organizational change at the White House and the outhouse. I hired my mom, my aunt, my sister, sent them all to college, and I learned five things I'll close with that they taught me. But I'm a father to millions now. 23 churches, five businesses, three TV shows, eight best-selling books. I learned from a mother who was my father. Five things as I close. Number one. Be present. You can't be an absentee parent. You gotta be present. My son, who's this big military guy, I said, of all the things we did together, son, what did you appreciate the most? Uh, going on Air Force One with me, going to the White House, meeting Nelson Mandela. What, what, what was the most meaningful thing? He said, you, you don't know the truth? No, lie to me. Yeah. <laughs> when you would come home, grab a football, and take me outside, You were present. And we could talk about anything throwing that ball. To this day, when I see him, he grabs the football. <laughs> <laughs> These kids drive me crazy, Pops. What do I do? And we just talk and talk and talk. Be present. Number two, be attentive. Get down to where they are. I used to play video games on the floor with my kid, read books to them on the floor, read childcraft, but be attentive. Why? Every human being has a tattoo across their forehead, which is MMFI, make me feel important. People may forget what you say, they may not remember what you did, but they'll never forget how you made them feel. Be present, be attentive, be affirming. Raise up a child. See the greatness in them. the word education is Latin for educare. It means to see what's inside and pull it out so they can see it. My mother had an eighth grade education, but she made sure I read books on Nelson Mandela, on Martin Luther King, on John Kennedy, that I read about great men. She could not be a man for me, but she made sure. You know what happened to me reading so many books? I developed a photographic memory. I can look at anything, I read books, chapters, can't forget a thing, because my mother had a stack of books by my bed. She says, honey, they can take your house from you, they can take the car from you, they can take anything, but they can never take your education. Once you have it, it is yours until you die. Invest in knowledge. PhD, from mom's encouragement. Be present, be attentive, be affirming, be consistent. 
we now have a mentoring program through sports. And we've learned that if a person spends one hour a week with a child over a full year, they change head, hearts, hands, habits about that kid. But you've got to be what? Consistent. If you start and stop, you destroy them. But if you show up one hour a week for a full year, they're transformed. Be present. Be attentive. Being affirming. <coughs> be consistent. And lastly, be committed to it. Four Greek words for love. Eros, passion. Pelea, <coughs> unity. Storge, nurturing. And agape, committed sacrifice. You know, guys, ladies, friends, countrymen, <laughs> I was born a trick baby, but the trick was on the evil people trying to destroy me. I believe this one thing. Everything we go through in life, is a down payment on our destiny. Better or bitter, that's our choice. And I chose because of two women, my mother, my aunt, and a third, the teacher, taught me how to be a man. God bless you. Wow, how do you top that, huh? <laughs> the uh, habit of ending with a joke um, to make our congregation more generous because um, <coughs> we're going to take the offering. I, uh, I s thought that uh, in honor of Father's Day, I should tell a dad joke, <laughs> <laughs> which means that uh, you're, you, have to, uh, you have to groan. <laughs> and uh, this is a dad joke you probably have, have heard because it's been going around the internet. A priest, a pastor, and a rabbit entered a clinic to donate blood. The nurse asked the rabbit, what's your blood type? And he said, I'm probably a type O. <laughs> <laughs> We appreciate your generous donations, which support your, our dedicated <laughs> staff, beautiful facilities, inspiring services, interesting activities, and social outreach at All Face. If you're with us on our live stream service, you can mail checks or visit our website at allfaceuu.org. The morning offering will now be taken. This flickering candle illuminate the night the way your spirit illuminates my soul. Papa.
Papa, can you hear me? Papa, can you see me? Papa, can you find me in the night? Papa, are you near me? Papa, can you hear me? Papa, can you help me not be frightened? Looking at the skies, I seem to see a million eyes. Which ones are yours? Where are you now that yesterday has waved goodbye and closed its doors? The night is so much darker. The wind is so much colder. The world I see is so much bigger now that I'm alone. Papa, please forgive me. Try to understand me. Papa, don't you know I had no choice? Can you hear me praying anything I'm saying? Even though the night is filled with voices. I remember everything you taught me, every book I've ever read. Can all the words in all the books help me to face what lies ahead? The trees are so much taller, and I feel so much smaller. The moon is twice as lonely, and the stars are half as bright. Papa, how I love you. Papa, how I need you. Papa, how I miss you. Kissing me. Thank you, Barbara. I mean, uh, Carlos. <laughs> I miss you, Joan. It was Joan's song. Our closing words are these. May God bless you with discomfort at easy answers, half-truths, and superficial relationships so that you may work for justice, freedom, and peace. May God bless you with tears to shed for those who suffer pain, rejection, hunger, and war so that you may reach out your hand to comfort them and to turn their pain into joy. And may God bless you with enough foolishness to believe that you can make a difference in the world so that you can do what others claim cannot be done to bring justice and kindness to all our children and the poor. He was a giant And I was just a kid I was always trying To do everything he did I can still remember Every lesson he taught me Growing up, learning how to be Like my old man He was a lion my father's pride but I was defiant when you made me walk the line 
thank the Reverend Ron Archer for his inspiring personal message. We thank Carlos Garcia for the music, Regina Comartin on camera, Ed Elrond on sound, Joe Gaten, our sexton, Joyce Chafer for the flowers, Nicole Racine and Frank Geltner for our hospitality, and our friendly greeters. It's good to be connected in whatever way that we can. And now I'll extinguish the candle in uh, in Wayne's honor in Wayne Robinson's honor and please recite the um, extinguishing words in your service we extinguish this flame but not the light of truth the warmth of community or the fire of commitment these we carry in our hearts and out into the world Please join us for coffee, cookies, and conversation in the social hall. <laughs> 